Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Chris Zumstrom. Chris comes to us from Lisbon, Portugal. And Chris, a little background, he had a fa- he was a founder and CEO of two businesses, Ruka and Yorba. And uh, Chris comes to us today from, again, Lisbon, but he started at the University of Kansas. So first of all, welcome to the show, Chris, yeah. and tell us a little bit how you got from the University of Kansas to Portugal. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ted. And uh, nice to meet you. And thanks for having me on. And um excited to be on the implementers podcast um, as a process design nerd so um yeah no, i started um, i grew up i was born in oklahoma uh, grew up in iowa went to school in kansas um so very midwestern roots um my parents are professors at universities so grew up in college towns in the midwest and then um yeah basically went to chicago to start kind of my first uh, foray into like the ad agency world basically in building healthcare applications and stuff like that uh, learning process design, learning agile design development. Um, and that took me on a wild ride um, doing, you know, working um, at BSA Partners and Accenture Interactive, what becomes Accenture Interactive, um, doing kind of lead product owner, product management, digital strategy, uh, which took me from New York. I ran a design studio in Tokyo uh, for IBM for six months to get that up off the ground, uh, doing agile that uh, design and development studio and uh, instilling that into the Japanese Salesforce culture of IBM. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, what really started the notion that like, there's a lot of different ways to build things and meeting lots of really talented people from, in Vietnam and Japan. Then I came back to New York, did a startup, was kind of tethered to my desk at, um, in New York. And that ultimately uh, kind of gave way to what then birthed Ruka. And when Ruka was born, um, I've been traveling ever since and kind of uh, running this distributed uh, remote design cooperative um, from Costa Rica, from Portugal, from New York, from France, so all over the place. So I love it. It, it seems like you've been doing a lot of traveling in your life, meeting yeah. a lot of different people and a lot of different experiences. But the thing, the glue that holds it all together is the organizational framework, organizational design, process control, things like that. Yeah. What is it that Chris is looking for? that you're searching for and put you where you are today as the, the leader of two organizations, but you've been in leadership positions in the past, but what is it that you're looking for through all of these different activities and uh, endeavors? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we look for um, strong, independent people, uh, people that don't want to necessarily manage lots of other people, um, people that traditional career paths um, don't interest them. Right. Um, so I think a lot of, kind of the behavioral, um, like as product designers, like Ruka, we treat as a product and kind of the behavioral design of Ruka was when I was running agencies in New York and Tokyo and Chicago, um, we would, I would have all these really talented design leads that didn't really want to be directors because they didn't want to be hand off mouse, basically, is how we'd say it. They wanted to be on the mouse and del- like leading by example. And they would do all these side projects and they would do all these things on the side to like scratch that itch um, that they weren't getting through traditional agency work um so with ruka we um embrace that itch basically and everybody can be independent people can be full-time employees um, but what we give them um, is freedom um, to create and we have a flat structure uh, run by uh, what we call os the operating system of ruka so it's very flat and it's a servant leadership model um, run by kind of the core business tenants that we need for people to be successful Um, but we're looking for people um, that don't want to manage 10 to 20 people in their career now because we've seen a lot of designers over the years that if you're really, really talented to design, you eventually don't design, right? And you manage mm-hmm. spreadsheets and stuff. So we try to get those people, um, where they're usually like associate creative directors, design leads and stuff, where the next step for them in a traditional uh, corporation or agency would be to be like an executive creative director where they're just presenting all the time other people's work. And we try to, um, and we do empower them 
um, to run their own projects and kind of be you know, power their entrepreneurial side inside of Ruka. So in effect, they become businesses within your business, but they're in control yeah. of their destiny. They have the freedom to do and what they want. But I am I correct in saying that a lot of them have the creative itch that they're always trying to scratch and feel that yeah. oneness, if you will, with what they're doing? Is that what attracts these individuals to your organizations? Yeah, I think the, the I think at, at the end of the day, the trust that we put in people, because um, we give the people a lot of trust to run projects on their own. Um, there's a very little oversight, check-in type of stuff. Um, that doesn't say that there's none, because um, obviously we have like a, my co-founder who's been my long-term, long-time business partner um, who runs design. So you can always check in on what you need, but it's not a top-down, like making small changes to make changes in decks to do decks. So, and we all, the whole organization is run on um, agile, right? So it's all very much doing over documentation and um, they're able to scratch a lot of those itches. And a lot of people never want to leave Ruka, even if it's a little slower sometimes, like we go through cycles, like any services firm does in summer season, stuff like that. And um, when it's slower, like everybody doesn't want to leave. So they'll do nonprofit work at a lower rate tier. They might have like some people are their own S corps. Some people are on LLCs. We have full-time employees. We feel like it's the best thing to give people the choice to um, structure um, the time that they want to. And people use that in different ways, right? We have, the, I guess Ruka really challenges, which a lot of people like the notion of like, what is an FTE? Right. We have FTCs that we pay on stipends. Basically, they might make X amount um, per month and that and they only work on Ruka stuff, but they wouldn't be a traditional FTE per se, mainly because we have a lot of people that are moving around. Right. So we don't want to deal with uh, country bureaucracies all over the world. Right. And sometimes we use deal dot com and those type of things. But um, in general, um, people like their freedom. And, you know, some people we have are. Um, stay at home dads or stay at home moms or start writing a book or starting their own company, their own startup, which we're also maybe supporting. So they're only full time on services work 20 hours a week. And to them, that's full time and we consider them full time. And so it's a, it kind of picks up that notion of traditional career tracks for creatives, I would say. So how do the, how do you get independent people who love their freedom to collaborate with each other across the world? I mean, that's something that I feel like might not have been possible like 10 years ago. I mean, we started kind of a global Slack HQ, I guess. We started seven years ago almost. Uh, last, So a month ago was our seven-year anniversary. So, um, And it started with four people. Now I think there's 120 people in there. Um, there's people that are founders we've invested in. So there's, there's a mix of tons of different people. Um, but the way that we run um, is largely through Slack as like a global headquarters. We do have uh, co-working office spaces um, where people can go in in kind of locations that we have like more than five or 10 people. So those are, um, you know, we have a space here in Lisbon, Portugal, for our EU headquarters. Uh, we have a space in New York. We have a space in Costa Rica. Of course, I used to live down there and we have designers down there. Um, and then we have one in Paul and one in the Philippines as well. So, um, you know, but it's an optional. It's not to, like it's only if they really want to. So we don't really ever get office space and um, that is long-term leases. It's really always flexible um, is our goal to always um, have that, you know, be an option. So, but yeah, I think, and then a little bit on the Ruka OS point, uh, my co-founder head of operations, which I think has been some of our secret sauce, like having uh, Nolan, who's my head of design, um, who's been with, with me on lots of different projects, understand and kind of embrace that kind of, uh, what we call a uh, quiet competence, right? So not just like talking at people, not talking all the time, like, like being quiet, but leading by by example, and that sets the tone for Ruka and uh, Nolan and how he runs design, because we, then we don't have a lot of like loud mouse, and we don't have the people that talk over people. And our clients on the services side love that because we're like an extension of their team. And then the other kind of secret sauce, I guess, is um, my co-founder who I've known since high school in Iowa playing soccer. Um, I recruited him, I guess, when I was licking my wounds off my startup that had failed. Um, because I wanted to run this agency, but I wanted to run it very different. And he owns Italian and pizza restaurants in Chicago. So he's kind of put a whole different like industries model into a very lean organization. And he runs uh, what we call Ruka OS, which is like, you know, it's just taking the tools you need. Like you need time tracking, you need all these things. So it's like, you need payment stuff. So we have like harvest and all these things. It's all connected through Zapier. And basically it's all automatically run every month. People get paid. People trust that they're going to get paid. 
Um, it's all uh, very clean. And we don't have to have like a huge operational office to do that. We have a couple of full-time people that help run the books. You so, mentioned uh, briefly there that you, in your earlier career, had an organization you started, but it failed. What yeah. was that experience like for you? That was brutal. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I think, so I, I had run, uh, at the time, I had just left running the New York office for a company called Idean that got purchased by Capgemini. Those guys are great Finnish guys, and they taught me a lot about, like, a heart and soul of a company. Um, but, like, I had been running, like, IBM design retainers for, like, two agencies now, and, like, there's lots of money flying around in enterprises. I was like, oh, I'm going to try my hand at startup, and then you realize how much harder that is. Um, so, you know, talking to investors for... Um, you know, I think we probably talked to 150, 200 investors. We raised, I think, 700,000 seed. Uh, we could never raise a Series A. It was a political tech startup in 2016. Um, I think we actually timed the market really, really well, but didn't have the right product. And, you know, as you, your implementers podcast, you know, you got to have all those things kind of line up um, to be successful. So I think we had a good team. Um, I think we had um, good timing, and then we didn't have the right product, and we didn't have enough runway to build the right product. Um, so I took a lot of the lessons from there. That's actually how Ruka gets its name. Um, it's actually from a 1990s song called Waiting for Your Ruka, um, which is about your loved one, basically, um, like in Chino, Southern California slang. So Nolan, um, who was my design lead at the company is called Advocate. Um, it was, think of it like a Yelp slash Rotten Tomatoes for politicians. <laughs> That's what we were trying to do. <laughs> um, so, um, and then Facebook became that. I'm kidding. But um, the, so we, we took a lot of that and was, we were like, oh, we're just waiting for our Ruka, waiting for our Ruka. And then we're like, well, as product people, let's just build Ruka. So we bought Ruka.vc. And the first website for Ruka was Ruka.vc. And it was basically how we hate venture capitalists and that we're going to invest in ourselves from here forward. And we're going to do services contracts, cut 20% of that out of it and build our own fund and fund our own projects. And we've been doing that ever since. So we have no external capital. How did you implement in your own life the lessons you learned from failure? Because some people, they run from it. They can't, they can't manage it internally. How did you implement those changes and the lessons that you learned into your future organizations? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, so Advocate was based in New York and San Francisco. Um, we raised money. We followed the path that kind of the chess game that um, is startup life and VC capital. And so we followed the path they tell you to follow um, and then realized that uh, that is a it's a game that you lose control eventually. So I think what we wanted to build with Ruka um, was a chess board that we control and we control the timing of it. It might be slower. We might have not have as much capital. We definitely don't, um, but it's more thoughtful and it's more kind of brick by brick by brick. So we definitely learned uh, from Advocate that, um, you know, there. And then I guess also from having people in New York and San Francisco, we had a lot of really talented, but honestly, like high cost uh, people, right? So one of the other things, and we were all just tethered there. We never traveled. We never did anything. It was just like, in this we work at like 8 a.m. out at 8 p.m. and the 8 out at 8 p.m. I just took the L train back and forth from Williamsburg to Union Square for like two years. It was a uh, it was a rough rough two years. So then after that we we're like, well, you know, people like that. We want more of those people, but we'll let them. You can work from anywhere, right? But you have to work. We there were at, Rook only had one rule for like the first like five years and basically still today, which is you can work from anywhere you want to. You can be anywhere in the world, um, but the respect of kind of your other team members, we work East coast hours. So like I'm in Europe, I work East coast hours, right? You can go to Southeast Asia if you want to, it's going to be hard for you to work East coast hours, um, but you can. So we'd have people that do that. So I think that's kind of the learning was that having a more globally distributed workforce and tapping into talent all around the world um, is way more powerful than doing in um, traditional hubs in the United States. And it gives you a lot more runway with a lot less capital. So, and how, tell us a little bit about your normal, typical client. What kind of makeup in industry and or size yeah. of company do you seem to attract? Yeah, I mean, um, this also goes from the learnings that I had at the largest agency I ever worked at where they put a minimum where you couldn't do any projects under 100K, right? Because it wasn't worth it. Right for operations, but because we have an operational lean model, uh, we take projects of all sides. We take two thousand dollar projects, ten thousand dollar projects, 
we have uh, retainers that are a million dollars, $2 million, right? Um, so we have all types of clients. Um, I'd say most of the time, um, it's more of the behavioral traits of the individual than the organization. Um, but they're usually kind of the change maker, digital, like they're going to be kind of CTOs, CPOs. Um, we do like one of our large clients is um, Forbes.com. We work directly with the chief product officer. Um, you know, we, we redid the Statue of Liberty.org's website. So we'll, we can do those things where we became leaner than a lot of these other, like, I would say agencies that get fat off of government contracts. Um, so like we can win those type of things. Our, tr- our traditional client, though, is um, it's really hard because we don't really have a traditional client. But I'd say on the person level, it's going to be an individual that comes from outside of the organization into the organization. They're like, I don't want other agencies and stuff. I want my like startup hustler people. And we're known as a cooperative that has founders that have failed, which is, in my opinion, the most valuable founders. Va- founders that have failed, valued founders that have exited. Like um, we have all those type of people. And then I guess what we call agency expats is the term that somebody coined here. And I don't even know who, but now people call them agency expats. So like people that have left agency gigs and want more control over their time for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we want a lot of clients that way. And then I guess also on the, um, we do well with like kind of startups that are like series A, series B have raised some money and trying to scale. So we've been working with ZocDoc, which is a New York startup doing their design stuff for five years now at one point we work with uh, Zola, which is a wedding registry website. Um, and we get a lot of people come to us because we have a lot of founders that kind of cross through Ruka and maybe out of Ruka. And then they go, they try something and we support them. Maybe it fails. Maybe it's successful. Now they get hired at like Airbnb. They come back because they know our ethics and ethos. Um, and they know that we're kind of, um, you know, what we say is kind of like, you know, doing over documentation, basically like we're very, much doers. And so there, that's, there's no, uh, that traditional agency, like account supervisor, account director, there's all these people taking notes. It's like all of our projects for accountability perspective have a business lead and a design lead. That's it. And then it's flat after that, but we have like accountability for the clients. Obviously we don't want to just have, you know, full flatness, but um, yeah. So I think we don't have a typical client. <laughs> we don't okay. like to have a typical client. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the end product that you offer, is it mostly digital technical type of design products or do you branch yeah. out from that? Yeah, it's mostly um, digital product design, what we would call DSDD, which comes from my Accenture world and stuff, which is digital strategy, design and development. So I'd say most of our stuff is that, although we have, we're going through two um, rebranding projects right now. So we just rebranded a company that got sold to some private equity that's not live yet. Um, and then we're rebranding an old client that, um, was on the stock exchange and is living on. Um, so, uh, we do a lot of branding projects now as well. Um, so, but at the core, everything that Ruka does is design. So that might be product design, UX, UI, branding. Um, we have writers, we have all that stuff. So that, I guess that kind of used to be one thing that people liked about us and was kind of our early days pitch was Ruka doesn't have, like, we don't have like a motion department that has 20 people in it. We don't have like a department or we don't have a writing group that has 10 people that sit on the bench. We have, very lean groups, but we have all the roles um, that people would need to launch a product, launch a company, or launch a brand in the first 16 to 24 months. And that's kind of our, that's our stump pitch. <laughs> and that works you, well because a lot of people launch things. You mentioned previously that um, one of the types of individuals that you attract your organization would be individuals who may have led or had a design business agency, but they failed. And you said you'd love that type of person. Why do you love that type of person? Because I feel like the people, like it becomes easy to you, right? Say you have one success right out of school or say that you're, um, you know, you get into YC, which we have startups that we've invested in that get into YC. So nothing bad about that. But like if you, that, that chessboard game that I was talking about with Advocate, if you play that game and you do that, um, it doesn't necessarily um, show you the downside of that. I, you always learn more when you're in the corner, right? So it's, uh, you know, like if you, because a lot of people, like let's say that you worked at a traditional large enterprise, like a Fortune 100 or something, right? You have very unlimited resources sometimes and you don't actually have to be held to KPIs or anything like that. Um, but the people that have ever had to been in a startup or anything that um, has to calculate time based on MTLs, which in our world is months to live, um, knows how you actually have to prioritize things, right? Because if your MTLs are three, right? So you have three months until you add a cash, you're going to prioritize that a lot differently. You're not going to make the dashboard look sexier. 
you're going to make sure the payment plans work, <laughs> right? In case you have to cut to zero, like how do you live after that? So those people learn a lot more. Um, on, sure. on your website, uh, the Ruka website, I love this. What yeah. you put is it's an adaptive organization that changes with the needs of the work at hand. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I love the word adaptive because um, people always, you know, we do, especially like, you know, at the start of last year, there's a ton of tech layoffs. We all know that there's a ton of agencies that have gone under because of that. And Ruka had a, like, I don't know, we had so many inbound people asking us about our model and stuff like that. And kind of what I would tell them is like, it's, you're not going to like it. Cause like what we've always said is that it's just this adaptive organism. We have no long-term business plan. We have no plans for exit. We have nothing like that. And so every six months it's redrawn, right? We have profit sharing um, for members. So people in Ruka make profit sharing on projects they're working on potentially. Um, but the adaptive nature is, is like, you know, we can have, we can recoil, we can expand very, very, very quickly. Um, but I think the main thing is that, that the kind of that Ruka OS team, my other co-founders, every six months, we kind of set an agenda on what we want to do. And that has ranged from, you know, we have our services, which we've talked a lot about. We also have our ventures, which is where we put a percentage of what we make on services to reinvest ourselves or reinvest externally. And we have, um, you know, we have shares in some companies that help think of in. Um, and then we have our foundation, which distributes capital um, to nonprofits around the world. We've bought computer labs in Nepal and um, in, in Philadelphia and stuff. And then we have um, our products, which is where like Yorba, the other company lives and other ideas that aren't as far along. But um, those four pillars change. They're like pistons, right? So like some of them might get more gas every six months. Some of them might pause for six months if we're having tight times. Um, some of them might explode for six months where we'll put tons of money into external companies because we're flush, right? Um, but they never go away. I think that's how we kind of adapt, right? The best companies adapt without baggage. And we try to keep as light a footprint as possible so that we can always adapt um, and don't have to worry about, well, we could do that, but our rent in New York is $20,000 a month, so we can't do that. So we try to keep very light footprints so that we can go with the wind, go with the waves. You've developed a very nice organizational model that is adaptive. And to me, the, yeah. the root of adaptive means change and change management. You have a very fast moving organization. It's, it's lean. It is adaptable because it is lean. But how do you communicate and help other individuals manage this change in the, in the environment, in their daily work environment, et cetera? How do you help them manage that change so they can implement the behaviors, the beliefs, the activities that they need to be successful? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, from a kind of the servant leadership model that we have um, upward, I mean, we try to instill a lot of type of things that are like training materials or even just opportunities for people to test out different things that they've wanted to do for a long time. They, maybe they came in as brand and no one's ever got, gave them a shot on product because they're a really talented brand designer. Um, we'll let them take a shot on product, right? Um, and But it might be for like a startup or somebody with like a smaller budget, like 25K or something, and they'll go above and beyond and they'll probably crush it and they'll get more of that type of work. Um, you know, I think when, whenever we do kind of, it's kind of, it's a self-regulating kind of change thing because we have a lot of independent, um, creators and stuff like that. It's its own kind of ecosystem that regulates itself because people, so if people bring work in or they're a business leader or design lead, I don't, there's no like, re, there's no central resourcing, right? Um, so your brand inside of Ruka is important right? Because you want to be known as easy to work with. You want to over deliver. You want to be known as like super talented, honestly fun to work with. Um, so that kind of allows you, and if you're not getting enough work, like that's sometimes where people will come to me or come to one of my co-founders and we, you know, we'll help them understand that, right? Of like, you know, maybe, maybe take one of these types of projects, but be the design lead on a smaller thing. And then maybe, you know, you'll get something, you know, larger, right? Like a morning star or some larger, um, services contract that we have going on with like a tech company. Um, but so I think it's, it's not, it's definitely not um, stick driven or like, Oh, you're on, like, I don't do pit plans and stuff like that. Those are like, those are dumb. Um, and so it's kind of more of like a carrot of like, here's the bar of what we believe you can do. Um, and if you're in Ruka, we believe you have talent and that can be very useful to us, to our clients, to our own products, to our venture firm, our, our things we've invested in. 
Um, and I guess we kind of change through giving opportunity, if that makes sense. On your website, you mentioned that you invest in companies. How do you go about doing that? And what type of uh, companies? Usually, are these internal um, individuals or are they external companies that you're investing in? Both. So we have two, um, well, technically we have three distribution arms, right? So there's our ventures, our foundation, our products. Um, so for our ventures, yeah, we um, write 25K, 50K checks. Sometimes we take equity and surround our network around them to help them get off the ground. Um, we've had success doing that. We've had uh, uh, exits doing that. Uh, we hold shares in the company going public uh, doing that from, uh, and we've always kind of done that. And the way that that model works is, you know, basically on like any profit that we might have, even at a lean organization, any profit we might have, like redesigning a website for statue delivery or something, some of that will go into this fund. It builds up. We make about three or four investments a year. So that's how we uh, invest in them. And normally those, in, those are in founders that we know or know somebody in the network. So kind of that circle of trust is extended outward. Not always, but a lot of times that's the case. Um, and yeah, it's usually just, our, we don't really, um, as you can tell from my days running a political tech startup, I get really tired uh, being told by Series A investors that um, I don't fit any thesis. I don't fit some thesis. So we have no thesis. Um, and the thesis is basically, um, our thesis, non-thesis, I guess, is that they're good people um, doing something that can improve the world and has some secret sauce in it, right? Something that makes them a little bit different, a little bit weird. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that's the venture side on the foundation side. Like I said, um, once every six months, the cooperative of Ruka basically upvotes a topic we want to. And then six months later, we upvote organizations in there, kind of like Reddit. And then um, we distribute capital, like 5K checks into you know, I think that the last one we did was for climate change in like Brazil and stuff like that and like donate it to those organizations. So it's not just a tax write-off because it's not necessarily all USA-based companies. So it doesn't really matter if we give them money or not to the U.S. government. Um, and then the third one, uh, which is one that I run, um, is one that I like the most <laughs> because it's our own products, right? So getting people that are entrepreneurial all together, the amount of ideas that are always come in my way of like, hey, what if we did this? Or this product sucks, like we could do a better thing of this. So we are always kind of testing different products and we have Ruka Studios um, in Costa Rica and Nepal and the Philippines and we can kind of prototype different things and we use usertesting.com to see if things are working well or something. And if it kind of passes a couple of tests, we might put some like back, some more money and time behind it. Um, so Ruka products is definitely um, how we invest internally into our own projects and people if they have ideas. And is that how you develop the Yorba product? Yep, that's where Yorba comes from. So um, Yorba started as like a, a design challenge, basically, between uh, kind of led by myself and my co-founder, Nolan, of just kind of like the internet is a cluttered, disorganized mess and everybody makes you create accounts and all this data is getting hacked and I get so many email new newsletters and stuff and especially someone... Um, that's been in like an independent world for a while, right? You sign up, like I've got accounts at client sites. I've got so many email addresses, <laughs> so many different things that I have to manage. So yeah, Yorba became, it was a, at first like a kind of research study design challenge on a lofty goal of like, how could we better organize and declutter the current state of the web 2.0 internet, um, which relies on surveillance capitalism. So how could we, make a platform better. Like a, it's kind of evolved into like a CRM for citizens type of thing. Helps you manage all the lists you're on, get rid of subscriptions, get rid of mailing lists and stuff. So, How did you take that of, from <laughs> idea concept to actual product, to actual introducing it to the market? A lot of change, a lot of things you had to do to be adaptive and resilient in order to do yeah. that. Iterative type of processing I'm sure was involved. What was the journey like from idea to actual marketing it? And now it's a product generating revenue. Yeah. 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 We launched in January and it's a live product um, that people are using. And it's great seeing people sign up every day and sign up for premium every day. It's been great. Um, from the first kind of stuff. So it started as a research project and like, like internally in the bowels of Ruka in like 2020, 2021, and then really started putting stuff behind it in 2022. Uh, but when we were just doing this research projects, like I mentioned, Ruka's design studios, um, we would have people be like 50% uh, billable on client work and 50% on product work. And so we were at a net zero, right? So we had no, it was not 
taking capital from us, right? It was just time. It was taking people's time from us, but we were basically trying to blend that in with our studios to get it off the ground, test concepts and stuff. And that's how it went for about the first year, right? It was kind of testing that. Um, we, once we kind of, our co-founder, uh, David Schwede, of, um, who's our CTO, came on board, it kind of left it up to another stage. And we started actually putting development hours behind it. Uh, and, and that started around. So it's kind of, it's been a, it's been this kind of ball that's like, okay, we hit this other checkpoint. Seems like there might be something there. Now let's put some engineering behind it. And we would do that for a little while. And then we went into private alpha with our own community, right? And we're like, all right, there's something there, but it's not there yet. It's still too confusing for a lot of people. And we just kept kind of um, iterating on it, I guess, and trying to figure out ways to extend our runway um, and kind of mirror the capital expenditure with the speed of Ruka services, basically, so that it's never, uh, you know, that's kind of our runway, right? We don't have, we haven't raised, you know, we, you know, we've had offers from VCs, right? Um, but it's never been something that is easy for us to entertain because it, uh, it would have been, it would, they would want to split myself and my co-founder Nolan that have roles in both Ruka and Yorba. And um, so we had serious offers for that, but, um, we've always kept it independent because I think it's a longer road for sure. Um, but it keeps control and it doesn't like, it doesn't, we don't, I don't want to give up. Ruka. I don't want to give up. Ruka. <laughs> I don't want to choose. Certainly so, understand that. They, they all work. They all work together. Right? Well, it's Yorba, an ecosystem. And when one improves, yeah. the other improves. And your bad scale will be the biggest proof point of what Ruka can do for every other company. Right. Like we got picked up in TechCrunch in February. They called us like the mint for decluttering your online lives. I brought a ton of traction to both companies. So good. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you seem to have solved one of the challenges that a lot of businesses, particularly I'll say small, medium sized businesses have. And that is how do I attract the, the right employees, but more importantly, or just as importantly, how do I find the right vendors to work with to develop and or enhance my product and move forward in the whole production and performance aspect? What's some of the lessons that you learned in attracting the right people or even being able to select the right vendors? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, one of the things that Ruka did was we kind of crowdsourced our own beliefs about two years ago. And basically like why we asked people like you can like a lot of, you're all really talented. You can be doing a lot of things. Why do you choose to do it here? And we kind of asked them that when we were redesigning our website, you can find that on our website on Ruka's beliefs. Right. And there's a lot of people that, you know, basically, you know, consider it kind of like a little tribe of people like they, they're, they don't want to do it alone. They want to do it together, right? All that type of stuff. Um, but I think at the end of the day, like Rook is not, pretent not pretentious and um, we really try to go above and beyond and like, um, you know, work for the people here and make sure that they're growing and make sure that they're having the type of work that, um, and working with the type of people that's fun, right? And I think that that kind of authenticity comes through to people inside of Ruka, they, they know that we're not trying to, to screw them over. They know that there's a lot of people here that operate not on a lot of paperwork. And I think that's a weird kind of thing, but it really fits into Ruka. It's like I, the contracts and stuff, obviously you have to have contracts and stuff, but like we don't sign like SOWs with all these different vendors and stuff like that. They trust that Ruka will pay um, by what I say um, and by what co-founders say or business leads say. Like, so there's a lot of just like trust in people's word. And I think that that attracts people because it's very different than like, you know, you like mentioned like a center interactive or anything and like they're great organizations and stuff. But like when you come from there, it's like every little thing is like, all right, we're going to need to uplift that for like 2000. We're going to uplift that for 10,000. Right. So we try to operate based on just like people process, like, which is like, what do we need to do? We have six months to do it. Here's the people, here's the roadmap. Um, and it's very transparent how you prioritize that roadmap is what you want to get done in that when we work with clients. So we try to not need a lot of uplifts and contracts and stuff like that. And that attracts a lot of designers that have tried to go their own independent way where they get, like a lot of designers have str they uh, struggle to get paid from small clients on time for sure. Um, or they, you know, they, it's just a hard, they don't want to do all that kind of the operational business side of creating cool things. And Ruka takes all that operational business side of creating cool things. So they come. Tell us a little bit about the trajectory of people that are working with and for your organizations. You start with zero. You got an idea. I believe you mentioned earlier in the conversation you have 100 people in that area yeah. working across the world. Give us a little bit of background on what that trajectory was really like. I mean, people have come to us from 
all different walks, but yeah, that trajectory, it, it grew with the projects, right? So like at the beginning, we had myself, my uh, designer, um, no one, um, a writer. And then it was like, oh, now we need a project manager. Now we need some operations. So it really grew with the needs. Like I think the trajectory of Ruka and the, the types of people that we have here and half the organization is designers in some way, shape or form. It's, um, so um, they like that because it's, it's a design led organization. And so they don't have to listen to kind of the business bureaucracy that they're used to. Um, but we've really only filled roles as needed by clients or needed on our internal projects, right? Like two or three years ago, we had no motion stuff. And then we started working um, with like PwC and like Trader Joe's and Pepsi and all these different things. And like, so we have motion people now. We have some full-time motion people. We have a contractor we trust in Chicago that works with us on everything um, animator. So it's really just grown with the needs. I guess that kind of, um, we, you know, we used to also kind of say it was like a little Noah's Ark of creativity, right? Where it's like, we kind of have, two of everything that you would need to set sail. Um, and, but we didn't have that at the beginning and we would only kind of add those pieces as projects needed them. And then those people would come in and like I was saying earlier, they'd kind of get addicted to kind of Rupert's morale because they're like, oh, this is a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun people in here. There's a lot of fun projects. Like, yeah, this is much more, this isn't as lonely as doing it myself and always having different people I'm working with and vendors and stuff. So, yeah. So you've been really created an adaptive organization that is an ecosystem yeah adapting to the environment consistently. You seem to be able to master the how to manage change in individuals and the business organization so that you can implement these ideas. Yeah. I'm going to assume that the glue that holds it all together is your servant leader philosophy. Tell me or explain what that is in your mind in actual practice. Yeah, no, that's, um, that, that is, I think, what holds it together. I think um, in actual practice, that's, there's not a lot of written rules. Um, I think that this is going to, uh, this might sound a little hippy dippy now, but, um, like I mentioned earlier, like I, I ran a design studio for IBM in Tokyo for six months. And then I moved back to New York to run, um, different studio, but still working on all that stuff. And that kind of the dichotomy between those two, I guess, cultural things, um, where it'd be kind of, um, Eastern versus Western, it's like cultural uh, norms is really how Ruka runs. So we're not a rules-based organization, uh, but it's it's not like a shame-based organization, but it's, uh, you know, we're really driven by, I guess, kind of the trust and transparency um, of all the people um, inside of it. And so that's just kind of what holds it together is that it's, you know, people don't just come in, like we don't, we don't need like in some of the studios we hire directly, but most of the time people are coming in through knowing somebody else. So if you're coming in through knowing somebody else, right, they're extending kind of like, you know, I trust Ted, Ted's coming into Ruka. So like if I bring you into Ruka and then you're maybe not doing that well on some project or something, like I'm also going to hear about it. Like, Hey, you know, like Ted's not holding his weight on the, the, some projects. So it kind of, that's the self-organizing thing. And I think um, when it comes from, you know, I guess my, the analogy I've used in the past, which I think some of my co-founders told me to stop using, but I'll use it again, is um, I would take the trains in New York and Tokyo, right? And then Tokyo, um, there's no signs about littering or trash or anything. Just nobody litters. There's no trash anywhere. It's the cleanest trains ever. In New York, <laughs> where I lived for six years, there's signs everywhere. No littering, no trash, whatever, but there's trash everywhere, right? So that's a rules-based culture. Um, and then, you know, uh, the, the flip side of that, right? It's kind of just like, the normal is you just don't do that. So I think Rukas um, definitely goes more towards um, Eastern philosophy when it comes to uh, self-organizing and that kind of, uh, you know, holding up oneself. Well, Chris, you've traveled a long way between the University of Kansas and yeah. Lisbon, Portugal. What's in the future for you? Yeah. I mean, I think the going back to like we plan every six months. So I, <laughs> It's, um, you know, where we want to go is, you know, I re so I was in Costa Rica starting our design studio down there for two years. And I moved to Lisbon, Portugal about two years ago to start up our EU entity uh, for Ruka. Um, we have a head of um, strategy out of London now who's full time. And she's been, you know, we've been getting more clients here in like the banking sectors and stuff. So we on the Ruka side, I think it's to continue, to continue kind of doing what works and uh, stay humble about it. Um, but probably not try to like grow tremendously. Like, you know, there's the scarcity is also a little bit of 
uh, what makes Ruka special, right? We don't want to be 500 people. I think people like it around 100, and we've interviewed our people, and that's kind of around the size they want it, like 100, no more than 150. So you start to, so you kind of still know who's who a little bit. I um, mean, you just know their names. So on the Ruka side, it's kind of, you know, focusing more on Europe um, and just kind of finding other clients that we like in different sectors like healthcare. And I think there's a lot of work that we've started doing banking and finance, but there's also a lot of stuff in healthcare where I think um, our model could be very interesting because it's a much slower model. And then on the Yorba side, um, we're working on a lot of cool stuff from Web3, um, you know, working with Tim Berners-Lee and his like solid organization out of London, which does like uh, data storage pods for the NHS and like the Belgian government. And we're going to uh, try to be the first platform to bring that to consumers um, through Yorba. And um, so Web3 federated storage. And then also um, we've been working in like a coalition with Consumer Reports and we're all kind of on the cutting edge and front end of um, making subscriptions and canceling accounts as easy as it is for unsubscribing from email. Um, as that legislation, I think there's an article just last night from Biden that about to focus on it. So we're preparing a platform um, that can be kind of the first authorized Asian platform out there for you to delete a lot of crap online and get leaner. <laughs> very good. Very feel, good. Chris, you have, so a, much better. you have a fascinating yeah. business story and you, you've accomplished yeah, an you. awful lot. And I would say that you did it with very innovative ways of implementing change. My congratulations sure. and respect to you. You've done a great job. I really look forward to watching what you do in the future and would love the opportunity to meet again just for updates yeah. to see um, if you're in Portugal or where your next move might be. So thank you very much for yeah. your time today. This has been a great conversation and much success to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ted. I'm happy to be here. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.